Hello everybody and uh, welcome to Erickson's Psychosocial Development. We're getting down there. This is lecture 11. We got one more to go and that's going to be the end of our time together. That will be the semester. So Annika's here to uh, relish in our progress and we've made good progress throughout the semester. I'm going to admit it to you right now. There, there's no use denying it. When we talk about psychosocial development, and contrast that to like Piagetian development, which is you know cognitive development specifically, uh, looking at how uh, the child thinks and how the evolution and thinking goes through a stage-like process, and we can look at Kohlberg's moral development. Uh, but Erickson bridges the gap, and, and uh, you know. I'm a big fan of Erickson. It says it right there, and I'll say it as well. Right, Annika? And what's so important about Erickson is when we talk about development, we're talking about socialization. And development doesn't happen out of a vacuum. Piaget doesn't really talk about this with cognitive development. That development is a process of interacting with one's caregivers and one's environment for Erickson. So it stresses our embeddedness in our, in our relationships. And it effectively and efficiently combines, I think, social, developmental, uh, and, and personality, and self-psychology. So it's really a broad-ranging theory. It can be a powerful tool for understanding ourselves and understanding others. It can aid us in becoming a much better person and, and perhaps a much better partner to those around us. Uh, it emphasizes the entire lifespan, and this is a big difference because most developmental theorists get you through adolescence. Freud gets you through adolescence, right? Piaget gets you through adolescence, or to adolescence pretty much, uh, and, and it pretty much is then done with us, right? Erickson's talking about lifespan development, right? And, and <laughs> I'm sorry. And, and let's get to, to one point. It's, it's just bitching. So let's, let's take a look here the big picture. What does Erickson say? Well, we move through predictable life stages, right? And, and each life stage presents us with a crisis or a challenge. And he's a neo-Freudian, so he hasn't, you know, abandoned psychodynamic theory. Uh, Freud, you know, coined the term psychodynamic, and, and what he's looking at is this dynamicism between uh, the id and the ego and the superego, right? Well, Erickson moves it a step further, and, and he says each stage represents a new challenge. He, he calls them crises, right? The challenge can be resolved, and we gain a virtue to be prepared to confront to the next stage. So one thing to understand about Erickson, in a perfect world, you need to complete stage one, gain your virtue so you're prepared to meet stage two. There's this idea that if you fail to meet the crisis and don't gain the virtue that's the result of meeting that crisis at any given stage, then you're really unable to fully negotiate future stages. So you can see for a therapeutic intervention, you want to go back and you want to look at a client and say, wow, these are the symptoms, these are the life issues that they're, they're presenting. What could have happened that would interfere with their developmental process at the stage that this represents? Right? So the challenge can be resolved. We gain the virtue. We're prepared to confront the next stage. Uh, but we can, if we fail to successfully resolve the challenge, then when we meet, and I'm going to go softer on this, when we meet future similar challenges, we're unprepared to meet them at that point unless we can finally work through it. And, and we'll talk more about that as we look at the specific stages. Our caregivers have a substantial impact on the creation of the self. And that's why I'm talking, it's, it's big in self-psychology. And you'll see when we get to stage five, Erickson's fifth, not Beethoven's fifth, but Erickson's fifth, uh, a stage that you'll be well familiar with and, and some of the terminology that we're going to share you're going to uh, oh that's where it came from Erickson huh so the caregivers have a substantial effect on who we become and it really is our becoming and our choosing but in relation to the environment in which we uh, grew up now you know there there's some potential points of contention stages are ordered and unsuccessful resolution of the previous stage largely prevent resolution from resolution of the subsequent stage and some people may say that's overstated right so no theory is without its controversy no theory is without its detractors uh, note that this is on average
average. So when we talk on average, and that's a big term for social psychologists, on average, we don't speak about individuals. We say, well, that behavior would be observed on average, right? So, or on average, we see this kind of decision making in this type of situation. So social psychologists are not, they're so much different than clinical psychologists who talk about this client and their issue. Uh, we don't deal in individuals. So individual violations of the model of development, uh, you know, especially the consequences of failure, right? There's going to be plenty of individual violations and social psychologists just go, yeah, because, you know, we're talking on average and there's going to be extremes and there's going to be individuals that deviate. Empirical support, right? can be lacking, largely true of any stage theory. And, and a lot of this is, is because it's difficult to validate, and this is the fourth point I have here. Longitudinal methods often fraught with alternative explanations because when we study longitudinally, we lose experimental control. And this is why so many of us love laboratory research, because we can control every aspect and we can isolate a variable. I mean, truly, I said very isolate a variable and then make uh, you know conclusions about the effect of that variable on a chosen behavior or chosen cognition and we can't do that in real life so longitudinal studies are fraught with all kinds of issues and you can remember that from your methods section so let's take a look at the stages and, and we see that there's eight stages right and, and the first year of life represents the first stage and in reading this chart the the first year of life then what is the challenge well am I going to learn to trust or uh, am I going to develop mistrust? And this is really based on my interaction with my caregivers. Do they respond to me when I cry? Do they change my diaper when it's dirty? Do they feed me when I'm hungry? Do they entertain me when I'm bored? Do they comfort me when I'm frightened? If the answer to all of those questions is typically yes, then what the infant learns at this point is, you know, the world can be a scary place, but there's people that got my back and I developed trust, right? So, favorable outcome then, faith in the environment and, and future events, that I can trust that this is okay, I can trust people, I can trust where I find myself. But now look at the unfavorable outcome. Suspicion, fear of future events. So, let me then take this a step further. Do you know anyone? Is there anyone in your life, anyone you've met, that seems to, at age 15, at age 20, at age 35, at age 60, that has issues with trust? They just can't seem to trust people. Well, if we have a person who's presenting with trust issues, and then we apply Erickson's theory, what we say is their caregiving was inconsistent and they never resolved this issue. So they learned to mistrust rather than trust. The therapeutic intervention then is really to go back and to somehow get this person to the point where they resolve that crisis but resolve it favorably in, in learning to trust. Right? So it's not like if you miss the stage all is lost. These things can be repaired but it's probably going to require some kind of therapeutic inter intervention or, or some really deep-seated soul searching and the ability to go back. Now the second year of life. Autonomy versus doubt. Autonomy is making choices and doing it for yourself. So when you become an autonomous human being, you kind of put yourself in the driver's seat. Those who experience self-doubt, right, doubt, don't believe that they can necessarily do it. So they uh, don't take chances, they don't push forward. So what are the favorable outcomes at this point? A sense of self-control and adequacy or feelings of shame and self-doubt. And, and this is usually tied to the phenomenon of potty training first and foremost difficult thing to do because you got to learn oh man I got this urge and then I got to decide that it's important to act on the urge and then I have to find a place to release the urge which is generally the toilet I have to get myself undressed to the extent that I can use the toilet got to clean myself up got to get redressed 
So I know it doesn't seem like a lot, but to a toddler, this is a, you know, this is a significant chain of events that have to be tied together into a single behavior pattern. You learn to do it. Your parents are supportive, right? You're good to go. But suppose your parents aren't supportive. Suppose, and this is where it gets the social aspect. Suppose your parents are, are some meanies, right? And, and, and you come out, you know, and maybe your cousins came over and you're having a fun time with your cousins. You're all running around, your toddlers, just running them up having all kinds of fun and you miss the urge you miss the notice or you feel the urge but you put it off because you're having so much fun you don't want to separate yourself from the fun to go to the bathroom the unfun situation and, and what happens you poop your pants right and now at the, when you, you poop your pants now you're stuck right because now you probably have to go find your caregivers and get some help with this it's more than you can manage so you go to your caregivers and, and they notice right away because you stink and they say well what the hell happened to you and you go well I pooped my pants right and they say oh okay so Mr. Shitty Pants good job on that you shit your pants well I'll tell you what Mr. Shitty Pants we thought we were doing okay but you shit your pants you're obviously not pat potty trained why don't you spend the rest of the day in those shitty pants Mr shitty pants so that you remember not to shit your pants and you're going oh mark that is just a little too extreme in fact I didn't even really want to hear that but imagine that there are some children that do hear that from their parents what impact what effect does that have on that child well <laughs> they thought they were doing okay and they made a mistake nobody's perfect you're potty training training right you're gonna make mistakes you're gonna have an occasional accident if your parents are supportive and they clean you up and they say hey you're doing fine don't worry about it it's just an accident then you learn autonomy you say hey I can handle this I'm gonna get it sooner or later but if you're punished if you're embarrassed then you may then walk away from the stage doubting your further abilities so how do we blow this up well Okay, do you know anyone who doubts their abilities significantly? And, and it interferes with the extent of them even trying new things because they doubt that they can do what they need to do. So as we move out of this stage, right, do we develop this sense of self-control and adequacy or do we develop feelings of shame and doubt? Uh, in, in the face of crises and challenge. So you can see how this works. It's, it's beautifully patterned, right? There's a crisis. Do I meet the crisis? And, and do I move forward? Or do I essentially get locked into repeating that crisis as failure over and over again? So uh, another example of this would be uh, choosing one's own clothes. And notice that as we come out of the toddler uh, stage, many of us want to choose what we wear, and that would be autonomy. Now, thir third through fifth years, and, and these age ranges are, are flexible. Some children are precocious, are going to be a little ahead of the game. Some may be a little slower, a little behind the game, right? Initiative versus guilt. So let's suppose initiative versus guilt. <laughs> you decide to... Uh, Let's stereotype your little girl and you decide to go in the kitchen because you're going to make your mom a cake. All right? And you go into the kitchen and you tear the kitchen apart and you make nothing, you don't make a cake, you big, make a big mess. Right? So here you are, you're a little five-year-old, you're in the kitchen. The kitchen looks like a bomb went off in it. There's flour, there's eggs on the floor, it's just a freaking mess. Right? And, and your mother then comes in from work because she's working at home. She comes in from her home office and says, what on earth did you do in here? And you say, well, I was trying to make a cake. And she says, if you ever touch anything in this kitchen again, I'm going to spank you from morning to evening. Leave the kitchen alone. You don't know what the hell you're doing. Just don't touch anything, huh? I know, it's harsh, but some parents behave that way. And then the kid then walks away feeling guilty. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it. I didn't want to, you know. But if the parent comes in instead, and this is where... Understanding Erickson's stages, I think, makes us all better parents and makes us better partners, if you will. If you come in and you say, oh, my God, what happened to this kitchen? It looks like uh, a bomb went off in here. And the child goes, well, I was trying to bake a cake. And you say, well, you know what? I appreciate your initiative or I appreciate your effort. You can use the term initiative if you want. I appreciate you trying to do that. But 
we're going to need some help because I don't think you're quite up to this yet. So uh, let's get this cleaned up and I'm going to go back to work. But I promise this weekend we're going to sit down and we're going to make a cake together. Right? And I'm going to start to teach you how to make a cake because I know you can do this. It's just that, that this is the first time out, it's going to be problematic. So how do you respond as a parent to your child when they mess things up? It has a profound impact on their negotiating these crises. Now, six years to puberty is an indus industry versus inferiority. So we want to learn how, to thing, how things work. So you're a little boy and, and you take apart the VCR and that's a videotape machine. You guys don't know what that is, but it's an old machine. And, and you say, I want to see how the VCR works. Right? So your parents aren't around and you take the shit apart and, and you got it now in the living room and it's got 10,000 parts laying on the floor and your parents come in and they go, oh my God, what did you do to the VCR? How am I going to tape Dallas tonight? <laughs> An old hit show, if you will. And, and, and the child goes, I, I just wanted to see how it worked. Okay, do you respond harshly? Don't ever touch anything that isn't yours again. Or do you say, wow, <laughs> this is a real mess. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't think I can put this back together either. So here we are in the same boat. I guess we're going to have to pick up all these parts and we're going to have to take it to the repair store and see if they can fix it. And I really don't want you taking anything apart without permission in the future, okay? I mean, I understand you want to explore, you want to experiment, you're curious, but you better check it out with me first, right? So, this is how we move ourselves through childhood, right? The favorable outcome, ability to learn how things work, to understand, to organize, or if you're told that you can't touch stuff, you'll never amount to anything, right? Uh, then you might develop a sense of inferiority. Hey, Penelope, did you come up to sit with your sister, Annika? So, are you guys going to hang out here? Or are you angry because she's in your spot? Huh? Are you going to bite her or something to get her out of your spot? Or are you going to curl up there? You're going to find a spot? All right. Now, transition years. And here's one I know that you've heard of. Have you ever heard of an identity crisis? Erickson coined the term. And that is the job of adolescence is to figure out who you are. It's to create a sense of self. So you come and you decide who you are. And this isn't I'm going to be a fireman or that kind of nonsense. What this is is what am I about? Who am I? Am I a kind person? Right? What are my values? Am I honest? So it really is developing these core kind of personality characteristics. Hugely important area in terms of personality, identity, and the self. Okay. Now, adolescence, you do it right, you experiment, and finally you decide, you start moving in on who you are, you develop a sense of self, you, uh, uh, you understand you're unique from others, and you have an integrated sense of self. But if you fail to negotiate this properly, and this can be, you know, you're between your peers and your parents for the most part, and adolescence is a big time uh, of, of shifting to peer influence away from parental influence. But do you take those valuable lessons you've learned from your parents and incorporate them? Role confusion then is, is the, the, the downside here. I don't develop a cohesive identity. I'm confused about who I am, what I'm about, and what I really want. Now, here's the deal. Settle this one. Figure you got a sense of self and it takes you to early adulthood. This is probably the stage where most of you would find yourself now, early adulthood, is intimacy versus isolation. Now, let's take another look at how these fit together. Because what happens is if I develop an identity and I'm now sec relatively secure in my sense of self, I know who I am and what I'm about, then I'm prepared to share that identity with others. I'm prepared to partner up. And it's that sharing is the process of intimacy, sharing information about who you are with another person, right? But now notice, let's suppose you don't develop an identity or a cohesive identity. You really don't know who you are or what you're about. How then do you become intimate with someone else? Because as I'm talking social right intimacy, not physical intimacy, emotional intimacy, not physical intimacy. I mean, physical intimacy is a component of it, and we can see especially with, with gender identity where, where this might become an interesting extra layer on this process, right? But are you able to make commitments to others, right, and, and, and to learn to love others? in various forms of intimacy or are you unable to connect because you don't even know who the hell you are and that means that you might be on the path to isolation 
And I have a friend who's a year older than I am. And he's never had a long-term monogamous relationship. He just can't. I mean, he so he lives. I mean, he lives an interesting life, right? But I, I mean, but as far as it's isolation, it's not intimacy. So he can't share of himself in that way. Now, let's go to middle age. We partner up. We become intimate. We've raised our children. If we want to do the stereotypic life, and we get to middle age, and we say, "Wow." I got this job, I got this house, the kids might be moving out of the house, and I say, what is life about? And now I start to worry about the meaning of life and my place in the grand scheme of things. So gener generativity versus self-absorption, I'm lucky because at this point I went to college in this age range, right, because I was worried about what the future held as far as how was I going to look back on my life. Was I just going to be a tech rep at the paper mill, living in a Brady Bunch house, buying a new car every two years, right? Or was there something more to life? And that's when I quit all that, right? I quit my job. I got a divorce from my second wife. And I went down to Los Angeles, and I did the school thing. And I did the school thing wholeheartedly. And then that led me to research, and it led me to teaching. And now I get this sense of generativity. That is, I am doing something for the future. That is, I'm exposing you guys to ideas. Now, you're free to use those ideas or not. I have no fantasies that I'm changing the world. That's not the issue. What I do hope I'm doing is providing you tools that you will more successfully negotiate your lives because you have those tools in your possession, right? So I'm pushing it forward. At least that's a sense I get. I have a purpose. There's meaning to what I do. So I get an experience of generativity that is that the, the society will probably be better off for my efforts. Now, what crisis is this? Middle-aged, middle-aged crisis. Yes, this is the midlife crisis. So that was another term of Erickson's, right? Now, if generativity ain't working out, if I ain't pushing it forward, then I just might buy myself toys. I might buy myself an RV, snowmobiles, right? Uh, there's a bumper sticker. I, I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. The man with the most toys at the end wins. And no, sorry, that's not the way it works, right? And then the aging years. What happens when we face retirement? Okay, so I retire and I look back on my life. I sit out on the porch. I'm rocking back and forth on the porch and I say, hey, you know, all in all, I think I lived a pretty good life. I worked hard. I helped a lot of people. I found life meaningful and I hope I, I uh, increased the meaning other people f saw in their life. You see what I'm saying? So... I feel basically good. Now, most of us don't want to age, you know, but consider the alternative we don't. <laughs> but but suppose you get to the end and, and your life is basically uncompleted chapters in a novel. Every chapter incomplete. I didn't do this. I wish I would have done that. I never did this. God, I wish I would have tried that, but I never did that. So now, at the end of your life, when you're 70, 80 years old, it's hard to pick up the slack. It's hard to go back and do those things. So that can lead to despair. So this final is ego integrity. Do I feel my life was a life well lived and I'm thankful I had it? Or do I despair because of the coulda, was shouldas that I did not engage in? Right? And it's too late to do anything about. So that's the eight stages. And, and kudos to Erickson for taking us all eight stages. Here's another little chart. Uh, I, I pulled a couple for you to kind of integrate the information because if you use one big chart, first of all, it won't fit. But what's different about this stage, I mean, this chart, is you got the virtues. So the verse virtue is hope, will, purpose, competence, fidelity, love, care, wisdom, right? So that tells you the virtues that are gained out of successfully resolving the crisis. And then the culmination in, in, in old age. So it talks here about a, a more conceptual and observable. So, for example, the last stage we just discussed. In this, then, the culmination in old age is existential identity. I know my place. A sense of integrity strong enough to withstand physical disintegration. And, and that's something that we have, is, is the body starts to fall apart. But do I still get a sense of a life well lived? And one more chart here. So you can look at this, right? Here are the important events. So, for example, uh, you know, 
uh, exploration, play, toilet training or dressing, school activities. And these are the, the ev environmental areas in which we're facing these crises. And then here are successful outcomes, right? So three charts for you to kind of to mash together. And, and this is the end. Now, your assignment then, if you look up your homework assignment, I wish you would please, it should be straightforward. You're going to be working this in pairs. So read through the assignment. And if you guys can read through the assignment before our Tuesday session, not, not tomorrow, right? But Tuesday, uh, let's see, what's today? The 16th, so Tuesday the 23rd. If, if you could read this in, we could talk about it on the 23rd. That would be freaking awesome. But you guys got to schedule your own thing because you're autonomous human beings. Uh, regardless, what do you think? I love this picture. And oh my God, I did this whole video in PowerPoint mode. You guys are going to have to excuse that. I'm not going to re-record it, so oops. My mistake, and I apologize. Anyway, guys. Have a great day. Take care.